Hi, this is Mike B with TFB TV. Now, this Enfield number no. 2 revolver we've got here is one of the last revolvers to be adopted by a major military power at a time when everyone else was busy adopting automatic pistols. Now, why a revolver? Well, it's cheap, it's in principle more reliable, but mostly it's cheap. Now, it's often confused for a Webley. Uh, for obvious reasons, and we'll get into that in a minute. Now, Webley were actually involved in the design, but in classic Enfield fashion, they took a design, added some bits of other ones, added some of their own stuff, and then ripped off the original developer. Webley sued Enfield for £2,250, which at the time would have bought you about five reasonable houses in London, and they lost. Enfield argued that, no, 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 this is all public domain stuff, and, um, uh, this was uh, Captain Boys of anti-tank rifle fame who designed it with Webley's help. So it was the other way around. The court unfortunately agreed, but in the end, Webley got £1,250 from an inventor's commission as a little bit of compensation. Now, as I said, it's basically a mashup of a Webley and some other designs, so let's bring the camera around and take a closer look. So it's very much a classic British hinged frame revolver design, very similar to the Webley that it was basically ripped off from in its overall construction. We've got a classic British stirrup lock here that carries the rear sight. Excellent sights for the era, big fat patridge type when uh, a lot of other countries were running with uh, pistols with extremely skinny sights. That's something they very much got right. Classic British stirrup lock, you push the lever there and it comes open. Ejects all six with a massive Mechanical advantage, so if it's full of mud, it works quite well. Now, as I mentioned before, it's basically uh, three designs in one plus some of their own ideas. Obviously, the frame is pretty much identical to a Webley, not a lot of difference there. The lock work inside is very similar to a Colt. You should be able to see that there. And the cylinder stop is basically classic Smith & Wesson. Now it's chambered for 38 Smith & Wesson and uh, the early loading is a 200 grain lead bullet, a bit like this one, this isn't a real one, it's a repro. Uh, suddenly they thought, oh actually that might be a bit naughty, hay convention concerns might be considered expanding, so we'll go for 178 grain FMJ, like this, and they come in little packets of 12, and in principle what you got was a revolver and all of 12 rounds of ammunition. I'm sure that anyone issued one of these was stuffing their pockets with as much as they could get hold of. Um, the British military thought that the 200 grain lead bullet was almost as good a man stopper as 455 Webley. Yeah, I'm skeptical as well. 38 calibre, 200 grain, 600 feet per second. It's hardly impressive, but that's what they thought. That's what they believed. Major advantage of it though was that it's smaller, it's lighter, less recoil, easier to shoot, easier to train people to shoot, and in an army that didn't actually take handgun shooting particularly seriously, you can see the advantage in that. Now, the revolvers that were recited for the lighter 178 grain ammo, uh, you can tell them because the rear sight used to go all the way to there, and it's been cut. So half of the length of the original foresight is cut uh, and it's reprofiled for the different point of aim for the lighter ammunition. Now you can shoot normal 38 Smith & Wesson in these but they tend to shoot rather low but that's fine. 
Now this is a very early one. This one is 1932, so uh, first year of production. These were actually produced from 1932 to 1957 and were phased out in favour of the Browning High Power uh, in the, well, towards the late 60s, uh, sort of phased in slowly. Uh, the British military never really took handguns particularly seriously. Um, now, the early ones are single, both single and double action. And from 1937, I think it was, onwards, they went over to double action only because uh, any idea of shooting aimed single action shots from the back of a horse was gone. So they really went towards a, um, an approach of rapid instinctive shots fired almost from the hip or, uh, or just raising the pistol up a bit. Now, um, as a result, these later grips are intended for this kind of shooting. And it's intended so that you put a lot more hand on the gun than you consider conventional these days for instinctive shooting at, at close ranges. In 1942, to further simplify, they took out the drop safety. So uh, a lot of these, if it's marked number one, uh, sorry, number two, mark one, double star, it's not drop safe unless it's been retrofitted. But I would be very wary of any marked with two stars until I've had it checked out by someone who knows what they're looking for. Um, but the manual says that the non-drop safe ones can be dropped from waist height and go off. And they recommended only loading five rounds as a result so that the, uh, the hammer was over an empty chamber. Now it's often claimed that the move to double action only was at the request of the tank corps because um, when bailing out of tanks, the hammer got caught on things, but the hammer is uh, well down inside this tank holster here and you're more likely to get the, the edge of the holster caught on the tank than the hammer. So that's unfortunately total nonsense. Uh, simply manufacturing convenience, speed up production, make it cheaper. Now overall in good condition these revolvers are good solid and capable service revolvers that sit well in the hand and have more than adequate accuracy. Not as good an accuracy as a Smith & Wesson or a Colt of the era but certainly good enough for a conscript army. But in bad condition they're awful, really awful. A lot of them are wobbly in the hinge, wobbly in the stirrup, I've seen a lot of Albion ones that are just awful. Um, sometimes they'll bind when you fire them. Uh, the solution to that is to put a little uh, shim in there. And uh, when, when you pick them up, the cylinder always has a lot of play in it, but that's because it's a Colt type action. And when you pull the trigger through, they lock up really, really solid, sometimes too solidly without enough flash gap and they'll bind. But uh, the little shim in there will uh, sort that right out for you. So thanks for watching. If you haven't already subscribed to TFB TV on YouTube, please consider doing so. And thank you very much to our sponsors, Proxybid and Ventura Munitions, with whose help this kind of content is possible. There's links to their sites in the description below, so please consider giving them a visit as well. Bye.